Now it's my honor to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but someone to whom we all need to be tremendously grateful for his scholarship, his intellectual honesty, and for his presence here tonight. Noam Chomsky. have to add something to the introduction to Michael, which amazingly was overlooked. Uh, as he reminded me before, he was my lawyer uh, 30 years ago <laughs> at, after a demonstration at the Skorsky helicopter plant, uh, uh, which is another kind of thing that people can do. Uh, well, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. You've heard all the important things I want to talk about. I'd like to shift gears a little bit. You've heard all the crucially important things. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, reasons for the extraordinary fanaticism of the U.S. attack against Cuba. Uh, it is uh, a remarkable example of uh, complete hysteria, and uh, which amazes most of the world. Uh, and where does it come from? Why is it going on? Well, there's a background. Uh, Cuba is uh, probably the oldest issue in U.S. foreign policy. It goes back to the 1820s, time of the Monroe Doctrine, which established the right of the United States to rule the hemisphere. Uh, John Quincy Adams, then Secretary of State, uh, said that uh, control of Cuba is of transcendent importance to the political and commercial interests of our union, indispensable to the continuance and integrity of our union itself. Uh, much more inflammatory rhetoric uh, followed from President Buchanan and others. By mid-century, uh, prominent senators went on to declare that the future interests not only of this country, but of civilization and of human progress are deeply involved in the acquisition of Cuba by the United States. And it goes on like that. I won't quote any more. Well, there was a problem uh, to the acquisition of Cuba and saving civilization. Uh, the British were a deterrent. Uh, the US couldn't handle the British fleet and army. Uh, so Cuba couldn't be conquered. Uh, that's the reason why Canada wasn't conquered, despite many attempts. Uh, John Quincy Adams had an answer to that, too, as president. He uh, pointed out that Cuba will ultimately fall into our hands by the laws of political gravitation, uh, just as an apple falls from the tree. <laughs> what he meant is, sooner or later, will power relations will shift, uh, will overcome the British deterrent, and then we'll be able to save civilization. Uh, and that happened. Uh, power relations shifted through the 19th century. Uh, in 1898, uh, the United States invaded Cuba. That was to the accompaniment of a very inspiring and familiar tale. Uh, we were liberating Cuba from Spanish terror. Uh, President McKinley, who carried it out, said we must carry the burden in the name of civilization, humanity, and liberty. It was pure humanitarian intervention, completely altruistic. That was accepted as gospel by war critics like uh, William James, uh, progressive writers like Jack London, uh, President Wilson, uh, and on and on till virtually today. In fact, US propaganda is so powerful that the story has remained intact, remained intact for a century. Uh, it's been repeated by leading historians, uh, right up almost to the present. Pure altruism and nobility. Uh, that's also affected Europe and Latin America. And even, to my surprise, very knowledgeable Latin American militants and activists accept the story, as I've learned from personal experience. Uh, the US doctrinal system is a system of enormous power. 
Well, in the past few years, uh, this story has been completely shattered by scholarship, uh, particularly that of Luis Perez. Uh, Cuba, in fact, was on the verge of liberating itself from Spain in 1898, which is the reason why the US invaded to prevent that. Uh, uh, quoting Paris, the US military campaign began in chaos and nearly ended in calamity with probable humiliating withdrawal, but the US Army was repeatedly saved by Cuban forces. Uh, their leaders, however, were not even permitted to attend the Spanish surrender to the United States. Uh, and to the disgust of Cubans, uh, Spanish officials were retained in office by the US conquerors until they could establish their own rule. Uh, all of this comes down in history as what we all studied, uh, the Spanish-American War, and not the Cuban War of Liberation from Spain, uh, which was foiled by US aggression, which is what it was no Spanish-American war. Uh, the, uh, there was absolutely no ambiguity about US plans. The Attorney General informed the Cuban Vice President that the US Army, in his words, is an invading army that would carry with it American sovereignty. Uh, distinguished statesman Elihu Root, then Secretary of War, declared that we are there, we intend to rule, and that's all there is to it. Uh, the general principle was uh, enunciated by President McKinley uh, when he went on directly from Cuba uh, to liberate uh, the Philippines from Spain, uh, incidentally uh, liberating uh, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos from this uh, dismal world. Uh, it was a huge massacre uh, barring Philippine independence, repeating the same story, actually barring it until today in reality. Uh, you'll notice that the Philippines are not one of the Asian tigers. In fact, the only country that's a basket case after 100 years of US rule, formally or informally. Uh, McKinley explained that we do not need the consent of the Filipinos to perform a great act of humanity, nor can we now ask their consent. He said, it is not a good time for the liberator to submit important questions concerning liberty and government to the liberated while they are engaged in shooting down their rescuers. So therefore we can't, uh, it's very clear. Uh, this was uh, elaborated by scholarship. A well-known sociologist, Franklin Henry Giddings, devised the concept consent without consent. Uh, here's the definition, his definition. If in later years, the colonized see and admit that the disputed relation was for the highest interest, it may reasonably be held that authority has been imposed with the consent of the governed, you know, sort of like if you grab, uh, you prevent a child from running across the street and later he says, yeah, that was the right thing to do, he really consented. So the Philippines, Filipinos really consented to uh, have hundreds of thousands of them massacred and their liberation prevented. Uh, just to show how much things have changed, let's uh, fast forward a century uh, to today, uh, 2006. Uh, as you know, there's a liberating army in Iraq uh, there with by consent without consent. Uh, we know a lot about that. Uh, the United States runs regular polls, State Department polls, uh, major polling institutions. A couple of them have just come out from State Department and major polling institutions. Uh, they show that 87% uh, of Iraq, uh, I'll give the figures for Iraq, but remember that the Occupying forces are only in part of Iraq, the Arab parts. They're not in the Kurdish parts. The Kurdish parts are allies, but this is for the whole country. So you have to expand it for the parts that matter where the army is deployed. 87% uh, of all Iraqis want a firm timetable for withdrawal. In Baghdad, according to the State Department, two thirds want immediate withdrawal. Uh, in all of Iraq, 
who want withdrawal within a year, and most others shortly after. Uh, again, Arab Iraqis, where the army is, of course, much higher. 60% Six, of all Iraqis, including 40% of Washington's Kurdish allies, support attacks on US soldiers. Uh, but uh, Bush is pursuing what uh, our local liberal newspaper describes as his messianic mission to bring democracy to Iraq and the world. Uh, and uh, pursuing that mission, Bush and the rest uh, repeat McKinley's words from a century earlier. No timetable. Uh, we don't need their consent for our altruistic efforts uh, in the service of humanity. Uh, the option of listening to the victims is not even on the agenda of the whole debate. I mean, take a look at the vast discussion about uh, uh, withdrawal and so on and see if you can find a reference to what the victims want. Not, no need for McKinley's reasons. Uh, well, uh, it's going to be consent without consent uh, or else. And or else is pretty hideous. Well, going back to Cuba, until 1959, it remained a, a virtual colony of the United States as conceded by historians Ernest May and Philip Zellico. Uh, what happened then in 1959 is enlightening. You've heard the details, I'll be quick. Uh, US economic strangulation and uh, terror began within a few months. We now know from declassified and other documents. Uh, by March 1960, there was a formal decision, uh, secret, to overthrow the government. Uh, economic warfare and uh, terrorism were sharply escalated by John F. Kennedy uh, after the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, responsibility for the terrorist war uh, was assigned to uh, his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Uh, his highest priority uh, according to his biographer, Arthur Schlesinger, uh, Kennedy's Latin American advisor, historian Arthur Schlesinger, uh, Robert Kennedy's highest priority was to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba. No secrecy about it. And the terrors of the earth were very real, detailed in Salim's book. I won't go through them, but it was quite serious. It was surely a factor leading to the missile crisis, uh, the most dangerous moment in history. Uh, we were saved from possible nuclear war by one word, literally. A Russian submarine commander uh, countermanded the orders of other submarine commanders to fire a uh, nuclear-armed torpedo when they were under attack by U.S. destroyers uh, and assumed that a war, a nuclear war, had broken out. He countermanded the order, which is presumably why we're here. Uh, by a miracle, the crisis ended without a nuclear war, probably a terminal nuclear war, which was very close. And Kennedy responded by immediately uh, reviving the terrorist campaign against Cuba and, of course, the economic strangulation. And so it continues right until today. You've heard about Posada Carriles and uh, the 30th anniversary. I won't repeat it. Uh, what were the reasons for this two-pronged attack, uh, terror, terrors of the earth, and economic strangulation? Well, we're a free country, fortunately, maybe the most free in the world, so we know the answers. Uh, they're in declassified documents. And since we're a free country, we can find them. Uh, since we have a very powerful doctrinal system, you can find them only if you carry out an individual research project, like the known, but uh, they're not reported, they're not taught. You don't read about them in university classes. Uh, in fact, you, don't, you barely see them in scholarship, but they're there. Uh, the reasons were are that, uh, I'll quote, President Eisenhower, immediately after uh, the liberation of the re first liberation of Cuba in 1959, uh, Eisenhower determined that the Cuban people are responsible for the regime, so the US has the right to cause them to suffer by economic strangulation. President Kennedy added that rising discomfort among hungry Cubans will cause them to throw Castro out, uh, helped along by bringing them the terrors of the earth. 
Uh, the State Department explained that every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba in order to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of the government. And that uh, basic thinking stays, stays quite constant, few fluctuations. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, when Cuba was in dire straits, uh, Clinton Democrats uh, actually did an end run to the right around President Bush, uh, forced him to accept a bill he was going to veto. Uh, the point was to tighten the vise after they were really in terrible straits, intensify the blockade, and the an announced objective of the liberal Democrats was to wreak havoc in Cuba so that the people will suffer and overthrow the government. Well, the motivation for the assault is also explained in the internal record. Uh, the Kennedy and Johnson administration warned in, that uh, Cuba's, what they called Cuba's successful defiance is challenging US policies that go back to the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, no Russians, uh, but rather the Monroe Doctrine, 1820s, which declared our right to rule the hemisphere, and they are carrying out successful defiance of that. And then come the usual reasons for intervention everywhere, the concern that the Cuban example might infect others. It's the terminology that's used constantly, infect others with the dangerous idea, I'm now quoting, of taking matters into their own hands, an idea with great appeal uh, throughout the continent because the distribution of land and other forms of national wealth greatly favors the propertied classes and the poor and underprivileged, stimulated by the example of the Cuban Revolution, are now demanding opportunities for a decent living. Uh, that was the advice given to incoming President Kennedy by his uh, Latin American advisor, historian, liberal historian, Arthur Schlesinger. So they really are a danger to the United States. It's a serious danger. Uh, well, sometimes the level of fanaticism is hard to believe. I don't know if you followed this, but last February, to just take to one example, there happened to be a meeting in Mexico City of a Cuban delegation and U.S. energy corporations. Uh, this was about investment in uh, Cuban offshore oil, uh, which is estimated to be quite substantial. Uh, there is a branch of the Treasury Department called the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC. Its uh, task is to investigate, uh, to monitor uh, suspicious international financial transactions, like those of Osama bin Laden and uh, Saddam Hussein and other such people. Uh, but the fact is uh, they've revealed to Congress what they actually do. You have to look hard to find it. Uh, that's a minor concern. They're not that much concerned with Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein and people like that. Uh, they spent about six times as much uh, energy and prosecution on possible violations of the Cuba embargo. It uh, tells you something about our priorities in the war on terror. Well, OFAC discovered that this Mexico City meeting was taking place in a Sheraton hotel, which is US owned, and they ordered the manager to kick them all out. Uh, that included uh, executives of uh, major Texas oil companies and uh, Exxon Mobil. Uh, punishing the Cuban people for defiance is much more important than finding large supplies of oil nearby uh, even if that would enrich the uh, good old boys in Texas and ExxonMobil. You have to keep your priorities in place if you're running a powerful state. Uh, Cuba does have a special place in U.S. foreign policy planning, uh, undoubtedly. But the general procedures are simply standard operating procedures. Go on all the time. Uh, one example that should be famous, is what Latin Americans often call the first 9-11. Uh, that's 9-11, 1973. Uh, the US backed uh, Pinochet coup in Chile, overthrowing the democratic government. Well, to translate what happened into per capita equivalent terms, I'll tell you what happened, just change the numbers to equivalent terms for the United States, 
that's the right way to compare it. Uh, the first 9-11 uh, was as if uh, Osama's terrorists had uh, bombed the White House, uh, killed the president, established a vicious military dictatorship, uh, killed 50 to 100,000 people, uh, tortured 700,000, set up an international terror center uh, that carried out assassinations and helped install uh, neo-Nazi style terror states throughout the world, uh, brought in a bunch of uh, economists uh, trained say in Kandahar, Afghanistan, so let's call them the Kandahar boys, uh, who uh, ran experiments with their dogmas uh, which they were able to do under the useful safeguard of terror and then drove the United States quickly into the worst economic disaster of its history uh, following the, the advice of their uh, tutors from Kandahar who came to visit and advised them and then went home to collect their Nobel Prizes and uh, acclaim and so on. Uh, that's what happened in the first 9-11. Uh, that was the hard track. Uh, there was also what was called a soft track. The soft track was making the economy scream by economic warfare to punish the population for voting the wrong way in a free election in this case. Well, not ancient history either. Uh, it's just been reenacted in the last few months in the Middle East. Uh, last January, Palestinians <coughs> voted the wrong way in a free election and uh, in pursuit of its uh, messianic mission of promoting democracy, uh, the U.S. immediately announced that it would join with Israel on a savage attack on the population for their democratic crimes. That's adopting the Clinton, the uh, Kennedy, Eisenhower, and in fact Clinton logic of punishing the people of Cuba uh, who must be made to suffer uh, until they follow our wishes and choose the leaders we assign to them. It was kind of an interesting touch in the recent case. Uh, the announcement that the US and Israel would uh, punish Palestinians severely and very severely for voting the wrong way appeared as a lead story in the New York Times uh, two days after a review in the New York Times book review, Sunday book review, a review of a collection of Osama bin Laden's speeches by a NYU law professor Noah Cohen, who's famous for being sent to Iraq to try to ram a constitution down the throats of Iraqis, which they rejected. That was part of the effort, as he explained, to ensure that the wrong people would not be elected. Uh, more democracy. Feldman described bin Laden's descent to greater and greater evil, finally reaching the absolute lower depths when he came to advocate the perverse claim that since the United States is a democracy, all citizens bear responsibility for its government actions and civilians are fair targets. The ultimate evil, who can dream of that? Until two days later, when the same newspaper announced cheerfully and prominently lead story that the U.S. was joining Osama bin Laden in the depths of ultimate evil, uh, all of which elicited no notice that I could find, at least, on the part of uh, educated, civilized people like those in the Athens of America right here. Well, there are plenty of other examples. I'll just take one last one. It's in the news right now. Uh, it has to do with the current discussions that are going on over the status of Kosovo. Should it be independent? What should happen? Well, that raises a question of why did Clinton bomb in 1999? Uh, the standard argument is the usual one, uh, noble and altruistic, uh, since it's not only usual for us, but probably universal, uh, Hitler, Stalin, everybody, uh, sane people disregard that argument. Uh, in this case, there was a specific argument, namely to stop Serbian genocide. Uh, well, so the story, as you all know, is that we had to intervene to stop Serbian genocide. Now, that has a little problem, too. There is massive Western documentation from the State Department, from NATO, from uh, the British government, but every impeccable Western sources, uh, which all conclude uh, 
uh, that the, there were plenty of atrocities, but they weren't the cause of the war, they were the consequence of the war, of the bombing. And furthermore, they were its anticipated consequence. We know from General Clark uh, and others that uh, the Clinton administration was informed that yes, that would be the consequence of the bombing, the atrocities that we're supposed to be terribly upset about. So that couldn't have been the reason. Uh, so what was the reason? Well, uh, it's been explained at the highest level of the Clinton administration uh, by uh, Strobe Talbot. He's now president of the Brookings Institution. At that time, he was the lead American negotiator for Clinton and the director of a joint National Security Council, Pentagon, State Department task force uh, during the bombing. Okay, so we're now right at the top level of the Clinton administration. He recently wrote, a f not a couple, about a year ago, wrote a foreword to a book on the war by his director of communications, John Norris. And in his foreword, Talbot writes that thanks to Norris's book, anyone interested in the war in Kosovo will know how events looked and felt at the time to those of us who were involved in the war at the highest level. And presenting the uh, position of the Clinton administration, Norris writes that it was Yugoslavia's resistance to the broader trends of political and economic reform, not the plight of Kosovo Albanians, that best explains uh, NATO's war. It's all very clear and unambiguous and familiar. It's another example of the need to prevent successful defiance. In this case, defiance of uh, Clinton's preferred uh, neoliberal social and economic order. Well, easy to multiply examples, I won't go on, uh, but it's perhaps enough to uh, illustrate that the Cuban case, uh, while a unusually shameful crime, is by no means unique and has a firm institutional base. Uh, that's why the pattern is regularly reenacted. And uh, the pattern is not only reenacted, but it's regularly absorbed without any difficulty in the reigning moral and intellectual culture, uh, thanks to what the uh, founder of the modern uh, tough-minded uh, realist international relations theory, uh, Hans Morgenthau, uh, thanks to what he called uh, our conformist subservience to those in power, speaking of American intellectuals, Western intellectuals in general. It's not a law of nature, it's not a law of history, and uh, if we don't like it, uh, there are ample opportunities to change it.